You can keep your job, it's fine. <laughs> so guys, during worship, there was a really beautiful moment where Aaron and the team entered into the space of gratitude. So I'm going to go a little bit off script here and actually just, I feel I need to declare and be grateful for the things that people in this church are stepping into, that they have stepped into for many years, the big guns that go ahead of us, the missions trips, the church plants, the evangelism, the the long steadfast marriages, the steadfast faith, it's all really, really beautiful, really moving. And I'm really grateful for what you guys do for us and for the young adults who are stepping into those things. For those who are off to America, Dill is there right now, Jade, you're gonna be there soon. The young adults who are engaged, who have been married, who have started dating someone. <laughs> I'm looking at Abby. You know, guys, there's just so much to be grateful for, and there's a lot that, that I feel we need to constantly be, be handing over to Jesus, because the more we step into his freedom, the more we step into what is designed for us, the angrier and the more intentional the devil is going to be about stealing, destroying, and killing those things. So just, yeah, with that in mind, I'd like to go into essentially a time now of sharing what has been on my heart regarding all the testimonies we've been hearing because it's been really powerful and it's been really beautiful to hear what people have been set free from and I would like to go into why they've been set free, why we needed the redemption, why we needed the restoration, why we need the freedom, but most importantly, why we need Jesus. I was trying to think of a title for this thing and a whole lot of things were floating in the air and I think the best thing I could come up with was the necessity of Jesus. And it's really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, I had this thought today or just going through or thinking about the previous testimonies that were shared. Testimonies reveal the point in our lives when Christ became the most necessary part of who we are because without him, we would not have been set free nor without continually depending on him could we withstand the often heightened attempts of the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy? Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 30, that his yoke is easy. But in order for a yoke to work according to its purpose, we need to move forward with Jesus. And that is what our testimonies are telling us about. They're telling us a point where we fully surrendered to Christ, and it was a turning point in our lives where he now becomes the everyday part of our lives that we need to depend on to walk in that freedom. So I'm keen to unpack two scriptures. So we're gonna start in John, specifically John chapter eight. What do I have here? Verses, verses one to 12. So it's titled, An Adulteress Faces the Light of the World. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, uh, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So, just to kind of unpack this, I see this as the part of our, our testimonies whereby 
we recognize what we've walked in, what we have fallen short in, the areas of our lives where we just walk in sin. And this is where Jesus comes into the picture. So if you had to break this down, starting at the beginning, if the woman, like the scribes and the Pharisees, had any understanding of the law of Moses, she knew for certain that in being caught, she would face being stoned and potentially to death. Instead, her most shameful, in her most shameful and fearful moment, she comes face to face with the lights of the world, with King Jesus. It's not what we deserve. It's not what we, it's not what should happen. But it's the mercy and the love of the Father. And in this moment of shame and fear and weakness, face to face with Jesus, she does nothing but stand there among her accusers of those who tell her what she's done wrong. And Jesus raises himself up. She's not brought to him, he stands up to look at her. He takes the focus from her and her sin onto himself. They stop focusing on the adulteress and they start focusing on Jesus and what should be done and what he says, taking all focus and shame away from her and bringing everything into himself. Then, after he utters the eternal words of you who are without sin, cast the first stone, everyone leaves, and only the two of them are left. I.e., obviously pointing out that he who is without sin, Jesus, may cast the first stone. He is the only one who carries the authority and the right to essentially condemn and judge and put her to death. But he does the exact opposite. He tells her to go to live a new life and to sin no more, to step into freedom, to step into something that she she is not, that she understands a new identity and a new way of living as instructed by him. But after, after this moment, I think we have to remember there's still a lot of human elements in this. The scriptures obviously focus on Jesus, but this woman having brought before him, being called an adulteress, being being told just the most hurtful, shameful things, and being caught in it. It's not like she was without the sin. She leaves the temple in the daytime because I think, yeah, they were teaching in the early morning. So it would have been daytime. People would have been walking about. People would have been in the streets. They would know who she is based on the Pharisees bringing her before Jesus. They were obviously men of high stature, people People looked up to them, people sought them for teaching, so they knew who, who they were. So bringing the woman, them bringing the woman in means they would have brought some attention and knowledge as to who she is. So she now has to step out of the temple and continue to hear continued accusations of her former life. And this remains true for us as well. When we get to a moment where we accept Jesus and we step out of our old lives, our old sin, we will continue to hear those voices. We will continue to hear those accusations. But focusing in and listening to Jesus, he instructs our new life. He begins to dismantle. We need to begin to dismantle and turn away from the parts of our lives, keeping us from our purpose as designed by God and paid for by Jesus. And then kind of linking that as the part of our testimonies where We are walking in sin. We are walking in a life not planned for us. We then get to a turning point, which is obviously Jesus. And then it gets to almost like a phase two, phase two of our lives, which we're then going to go look at Ephesians 6. So Ephesians 6 being the whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, so obviously this is Paul writing now to the church of Ephesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness 
and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmets of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So a little historical nugget. I initially thought that when they were referring to the armor of God, that everything they were referencing, their reference point was the Romans. So this is actually incorrect. Paul is actually quoting or referencing Isaiah 59. And every part of the armor of God that he references, the breastplate, girding your waist, the helmet of salvation, the shield, actually, so in quoting Isaiah, all of these actually refer to who Jesus is. So he's not asking you, it is metaphorical, but he's actually telling you to equip yourself in every aspect of your life with who Jesus is and everything he stood for. So this is backed up by a lot of scripture. So girding your waist with truth, John 14 verse six, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. The breastplate of righteousness, it's in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Shod your feet with the gospel of peace, Ephesians 2 verse 14. The shield of faith, Hebrews 12 verse 2. The helmet of salvation, Luke 2 verse 30. And of course, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So in, in what essentially we're looking at now is the second part of our testimony, this turning point. It's, it's now an understanding that the voice of the accuser is probably going to become even louder, that we are going to hear those accusations or we are going to see reminders of a shameful, sinful past probably even more. And this is why we are so dependent on the necessity of Jesus. In Ephesians 6 verse 10, it says, we are called to be strong in the Lord, that you may be able to stand the same way Jesus stood up against the Pharisees and against the scribes for the purpose of defending the woman, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then the four enemies, it's again, not flesh and blood, it's principalities, its powers, its rulers of darkness, its spiritual hosts of wickedness. These are things that are really intense that come to break away at the most joyful, God-gifted blessings of our lives. Our marriages, our parenting, our children, your businesses, your studies, whatever it is that you see joy in, that you see the kingdom in, they want to break down. So Jesus is the one who equips us to be defended against these things. So out of what is referenced in the armor of God, you essentially have six items. Five of them are defensive. And all of those, Jesus equips us in. It's his own way, or it's Paul's way of telling us that when we have equipped our lives with Jesus, when he becomes our truth, our righteousness, our peace, our faith, our salvation, we are defended against all those things. They do come in our lives, they are reality. But the, real, the even greater reality is who Jesus is and how he defends us against those things. It's also the fact that there are five, five out of six are defensive means God wants to make very clear that the enemy is very real and that Jesus is very necessary. And the one offensive feature out of the six pieces of armor of God is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, which is your Bible. And obviously, you don't become equipped with the sword overnight. It's not something you master in a moment. You spend time with the sword, you learn how it can defend you, you learn how to attack with it. The Bible is something you need to spend time in every day. It's something you need to equip yourself with. It's something that needs to become such a necessary part of your life, almost as necessary as a relationship with Jesus. And it's found in here. So in sharing how, how essentially we step from a place of 
walking in sin and walking in something that God did not intend for us and Jesus coming in and shifting everything and then walking in a life where we do get to experience this freedom, but it is being attacked. There is a really beautiful word in Hebrew. We are all aware of it. It's shalom. And it's used by the Hebrews as a greeting, but in English, which I feel lose, helps it lose a lot of its meaning. In English, when we greet someone, it's purely just to acknowledge their, their presence or the fact that we can see them. The Hebrews use shalom, which, or they actually use a lot of words, not merely to acknowledge, but to actually impart and to bless people. And shalom is no different. They speak it over people to impart its context and its meaning, which di its direct translation is most easily comes to peace. But peace loses, or just that word peace loses the true meaning of what shalom is. Shalom speaks of a peace or a wholeness that is only found in Jesus. It speaks of a wholeness whereby Jesus is the only way you can achieve the completeness that God intended for you. And if you look at shalom as a Hebrew word made up by Hebrew symbols, it is made up of symbols that essentially are teeth, a tent peg, a shepherd's staff, and waves or waters. And what each of those means is teeth, which is to tear apart. A tent peg is something that binds you or holds you to something. A shepherd's staff is a master or control, and waters are chaos the opposite of peace, essentially. <laughs> and what Shalom is telling you to do, or the structure of its word, is to tear away at the masters or control that bind you to chaos. And that, that is what they are imparting on each other and what I would like for us to impart on ourselves. I would like us to remind each other beyond the turning points that as we walk together in Jesus, we are there to, to partner with them and to take down through Jesus and with Jesus what the enemy what the enemy has essentially is planning to steal, to kill, and destroy. So would it be okay if the band came back up? Cool. Thanks, Caleb. So guys, as the band heads, heads back up, I am keen to encourage and to impart. I really would like for us to understand that our testimonies and our life now with Jesus is this beautiful journey where we are continually being strengthened and we are continually being reminded of the necessity of him being in our lives. It is such a beautiful thing to have had him come in after a lifetime of sin or shame or guilt or the things that were robbing of us, robbing us of our understanding of our, our identity in God. But that turning point or that moment where Jesus came in is not a final moment or a final destination. It's a turning point into a new life of strength and understanding what we carry, not just as individuals, but as a church. So I'd like to take this space or this moment to minister or to pray for people who feel like they are unsure of what follows the testimony or what follows the moments of where Jesus comes in to understand what we are walking in and how we can be empowered by each other, but most importantly, by Jesus. Thank you, Ben. So if anyone would like prayer, if anyone would like encouragement, if anyone would like to just share in anything where they are struggling with, especially following where you shared your testimony. We'd love to minister with you. We'd love to pray with you. So thank you guys.